our key verse is we call it springboard springboard verse for this morning is Ecclesiastes chapter seven and verse number eight. Ecclesiastes seven and verse number eight. Where the wise man says, The end of a thing is better than the beginning. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. When I read that text, I also am reminded of a statement that Ahab, you know, Ahab is one of the wickedest men that ever lived. I mean, he's one of the sorriest ever individuals ever draw a breath out. But he said a thing in 1 Kings chapter 20. When Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, threatened him. And he said, in response to that threat, he says, Do not let him who puts on his armor boast like he who takes it off. He said, well, what's that got to do with anything? And what, ben, what Ahab was saying is, the man that puts on his armor is doing what? Going into battle. But the man who takes off his armor is the man that what? Has already been to battle and been victorious and thus takes it off. In a way, Ahab says what? The end is better than the beginning. And so as we, we think about this new year, I want us to think about the idea of being better finishers. Being better finishers. Let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody that's always starting something new? Always starting something new. In other words, I'm on, you know, of course with social media and whatnot, you, you know, they're, they're always talking about, I'm fixing to start doing this. All right, let's start. Three or four months later, you don't hear about it anymore. Then the same person says, I'm going to start this. And about three or four months later, you don't hear anything about it. I'm going to start this. And nothing ever is brought to completion. Nothing is ever brought to completion. Now, the ability to finish is far greater than the ability to start. If anybody can start. By the way, a friend of mine, Neil Selman, dear friend of mine, tagged me in a post this morning. He said he's going to walk a thousand miles this year. For his, he, he's not an exerciser. He said, I'm going to walk a thousand miles. Three miles a day. You know, how many people, you know, how many people have exercise goals that they've set for this year and probably by, by Groundhog Day they'll vanish in the, you know, vanish in there. I told Neil, I said, man, whatever I can do to help you, I'll help you. We need to get up early in the morning and go to town and walk, whatever, you know, whatever I can do to help you meet this goal. You know, it's great to want to walk a thousand miles and I, I really do. I want Neil to walk a thousand miles this year. But wanting to walk, and this is not a reflection on Neil at all, but the desire to walk a thousand miles is a lot different than walking a thousand miles. It's a lot different. And so we think about the things that we want to do for the church and the things that we want to do in our spiritual growth. For example, how many Christians want to know the Bible better? Now, I think that all Christians want to know the Bible better. As best I can tell, I've been around a little while. The only way to get to know the Bible better is sit down and open that thing up and start reading. 
Maybe find you some online Bible tools like Blue Letter Bible, you know, things that has concordances and dictionaries and, you know, some, some, some helps to help you understand words or colloquialisms or commentaries to help you understand some things. But what it all is going to boil down to, what it all boils down to is you're going to have to open up the Bible and start reading it. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's no, there's no magic pill. You know, to understanding the Bible or knowing more about the Bible. And so with that in mind, with regard to the work of the church, and by the way, I think we were I think we ended up with a great finish to 2020. You know, given all given all of all of the obstacles, if you recall when we did our budget presentation, that we were within one thousand dollars of expenses. Our contribution was within one thousand dollars of all our expenses for for the year. Very very few congregations can say that. Very few. And we kept up all the work that we were doing, and then did some things that were not even in the budget. One, with the idea of being better finishers and the things that are required to be better finishers. Number one. To, in order to be a better finisher, we have to be better planners. There has, has to be better planning. You know, Luke 14, 28 to 32, Jesus talks about counting the cost. And you know, it's interesting. He says, what man who wants to build a tower does not first stop and count the cost, whether he has enough money to finish it, lest he get started and he's unable to finish it, and people... Point the finger at him and say, this man was not able to finish what he started. When I first went to Ghana, I thought about that. First of all, and I thought I was wrong. I mean, I, was, I didn't think I was wrong. I was wrong because my thinking didn't reflect the knowledge of the knowledge of Ghanaian culture and laws. Everywhere you go in Ghana, there'll be skeletons of buildings. Isn't there, kind of a, isn't there kind of a skeleton of a building at the corner uh, of the airport road and the road that goes to the prison and the nursing home there in that, in that little corner? Isn't there kind of a skeleton of a building? There's some walls there, but there's no roof on it. Those things are all over Ghana. There's, there's block walls everywhere in Ghana. No doors, no windows, no roof, just block walls, interior walls. And I thought... How many of these people have started building things and they couldn't finish them? And I thought about this passage. What I didn't understand was, if you buy a piece of property in Ghana, you have so long to make improvements to that property or the government comes and takes it. So what they would do is they'd buy a piece of property and when their time was nearly up, they'd lay them about 100 blocks out there and they could show an improvement and then they have another length of time to, to, you know, to, 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 keep, to keep their property. But, you know, it's not that way here. Whenever you, know, whenever you see unfinished buildings, you know that you know, somebody has failed to count the cost. There's a passage that came across uh, uh, in my reading that, that I, I mean, I know I'd read it, but it, it really stuck out to me with, with this, uh, this idea. It's Proverbs 24, 27, where the wise man says, Make everything in the field ready, then build your house. Make everything in the field ready, then build your house. Notice, what's more important? The house or the means to sustain the house? You know, what good would it do for me to spend all my money to build a house and then I didn't have the means to pay the electric bill? You know, I'm gonna build a big, I'm gonna build a big house, and now I can't even I can't even afford the heat and cool. I can't pay the taxes on it or you know, I can't maintain it or, or whatever. The wise man said, in other words, you need better planning. In other words, plan for the long term first and then come and do the thing that you want to do. In other words, do what you need to do first, then do what you want to do second. You know, I, I guess it's just kind of a sign of the times and that, that you know, you know, it, took, it, took, it took Ron and me a long time before, I say a long time, a pretty good amount of time before we could ever, you know, build us a house. You know, we lived in, you know, we lived in apartments. And, and we, you know, we had to work, and we had to save, and, you know, and it seems like, you know, it seems like nowadays, young folks just gonna, they gonna get out of school and 
get them about a 3,500 square foot, you know, place, you know, and, and, a, and if they can do that, more power to them. But, you know, a lot of times it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't work out that way. In other words, they, they put, you know, they've put the cart before the horse. You know, they don't establish themselves and their, and their work history and, and they don't save and it's just bad, you know, and a lot of times it ends up, you know, it ends up not working out well for them. You know, it's bad, bad planning. Congregations can get caught up in that. I remember hearing a guy say one time that a congregation was wanting to build a new building, and here's what he said. He said, we got to build this new building because we need to grow. We need to grow. Now let me ask you a question. Does building a building grow the church? Do, do, does brick and mortar build the church? You know, and they built a building. They didn't grow. Why? Because that's not how you grow. That's not how you grow the church. But a lot of people, and here's another thing involved in this: a lot of people think that the building attracts the people, and in some cases, it's true. Especially in your big urban areas like you know Birmingham or Huntsville or. Florence or whatnot, a, a, a congregation will build a giant building and their numbers will go up, but what have they actually done? They've siphoned off brethren from the smaller congregations and they, they swell their numbers up and to the detriment of the smaller congregations and they really haven't converted anybody. They haven't converted anybody. And so that's not how you, you know, that's not how you grow, you know, that's not how you grow the church. You know, I've been on about a five-year plan to help this church grow. I've never said anything about it. But our whole series on Sunday night with the questions and the notebook and all that has all been a part of a long-term goal of mine to get this congregation grounded in the, in the basic doctrines of the Bible and the basic doctrines of, of denominational teaching and thought so that we won't be afraid to go out and talk to people and be confronted with these differing, you know, these differing doctrines and ideas. I think, and it's not any credit to me, it's credit to, to the church, but I think a lot of that is what's helped sustain us through some difficult times over the last several years, and particularly this year. Particularly this year. But it was a long-term plan. And, I, you know, and we're still working it. But I think right now, the Burleson Church is more poised for growth than it's ever been. Well, at least in the last 20 years or so. More poised than it's ever been in the last 20 years. So better, better planning. You know, congregations want to make big plans. People want to make big plans. But they fail to understand the groundwork that has to be done to make those plans a success. Then secondly, going along with that, it's better preparation. Better preparation. In 1 Chronicles 22... David and the people of Israel began to prepare to help Solomon succeed. To help him succeed. You know, David knew that Solomon was young. David knew that Solomon was inexperienced. He even said that in his prayer to the Lord. But the Bible says in verse, 20, uh, verse 5 of 1 Chronicles 22, it says, David prepared abundantly before his death. And the one reason, one reason I love that statement is, is that David was preparing for something that he would never see. David knew that he would not live to see the temple of the Lord built. Did David want the temple of the Lord built? Sure did. Did he not go off on his own with Nathan's blessing one time and decide he's going to build the Lord a house? And the Lord stopped him? I mean, David wanted this thing done. But in spite of the fact that he would never see it, David prepared abundantly to make it a success. And we have to have that long, we still, I say we, we also need that long-term vision of the work of this, of this congregation. We're not totally working for the end of 2021. We need to be working with a goal in our mind of 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050. But oftentimes we don't think that far ahead with our view 
of the success and the long or the long term success of the church. But we have to, we have to have better preparation and planning. Think about this. On your handout, there are three texts there: Malachi four four and five, Mark one one to four, and Matthew eleven, beginning about verse seven. Now, what this is is a collection of three texts that that simply teaches this: God didn't just drop Jesus on the world without some preparation. I mean, what did John the Baptist expressly say about his purpose and his work? I have come to do what? Prepare the way of the Lord. So, so even, I say even, as, it, as, it, as if I'm surprised that God knew that. But the Lord shows us in the giving of Jesus that there is preparatory work that is required to accomplish great things. And John's work, ever so brief as it may have been, was vital to the success of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to John's credit, John understood his work, he understood his role, and he also understood that he was not the focus of his work. Pointing people to Jesus was the focus of his work. He said of Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. Better preparation. Better preparation. Then number three, this. Greater patience. Greater patience. How many, how many people start start a project or, or some type of, 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 of effort and they grow impatient when it doesn't, say, yield the fruit on the schedule that they want it to yield fruit. Uh, yeah. I, and I, thought, I thought about this. Uh, I thought about this this week. And by the way, I've been guilty of this a thousand times, all right? How many times? Hey, how many times have you heard? How many times have you heard me say, or heard some preacher say, "What would the church look like if every single one of us converted one person this year?" You ever heard somebody say that? Now, is it not true that the church would the, the building would be a lot more full if everybody? But let me ask you a question. It's probably not going to happen. A church is not a church in the United States in the Bible Belt is not going to double in size in one year. All right. The question is because that's not going to happen. Could we not have a long-term goal to be twice as big in ten years? Now, so, say, Ron, how many people on the roll? 75? Here, how many people on the roll? 75? You know, counting all the adults and kids. I, I think last time I counted all adults and kids, it was about 80 or 82. All right, so out of that, you got about 45 adults, right? You know, well, what would, what would five more, what would five more adults or five more families look like in a year or two? You know, what would 10 or 15 more families look like in five years? You know, because just to be perfectly honest, we're not going to live forever. Now, I'm pretty sure none of us in here are going to live forever. And I'm pretty sure that most of us are not going to be around in 2050. So what, you know, what is our, Walter, are you going to be around 2050? Okay. I saw Walter shaking his smile like he was going to make it, so I thought I'd better ask him. You know, 20, you know, you know 2050. I'll be 83 years old. You know, there's a good chance I'm not going to be here. Rhonda might kill me before then. <laughs> Although she ain't done it in 33 years, it's probably not going to happen. You know, but what is it? You know, what is our long-term view for the success of the Bur of, of the Burleson Church? 
And can we get a plan and work it with patience? The Bible says you have need of patience. The, the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. Hebrews 12, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And in so doing, we understand what Jesus said in John 4, 35 to 38, that others will reap where you have sown. What was David preparing for? David was sowing so that his son and the people of Israel could reap, even though he would never see the result of the harvest. I had a preacher friend, he's still a preacher friend of mine. Loved him dearly. He worked at a congregation, and, and this congregation had a particular need. All right? And I'm not going to mention it because there will be people watching that are probably from there that will remember that they'd know him, they'd know the situation. So what I'm going to say is I had a preacher friend, and the place where he preached had a particular need. All right? And he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he stayed at the congregation a number of years. And he was never able, he was never able to convince either the elders or whoever that this thing needed to be done. Okay? He eventually, he, he eventually he took another position. Left that congregation. Not wasn't fired or you know, not anything like that. But he took another position and he went and worked somewhere else. Within about two years, guess what that church did? Guess what they did? They did the very thing he'd been begging them to do for years. And it kind of hurt his feelings. But in talking to him, we reminded him of this verse. Just because you didn't get to see the fruit of all that work, rejoice that now the congregation has what you have known that it needed all of those years. In other words, another preacher is reaping where you have sown. And what does the Bible say about he that sows and he that reaps and he that get, or he that sows and he that reaps or he that sows and he that gathers? They both what? What's the Bible say? They both rejoice. The sower and the reaper. Two different people, they both rejoice when good things happen. And so we need to understand that if we're going to be better finishers, that there's a really good chance, well, there's almost a certainty that some of us are not going to see the fruit of our efforts. But in light of that, so anyway. So anyway, greater patience. Number four, we need unwavering persistence. Unwavering persistence. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How about this one? Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For we know we shall reap in due season if we faint not. Don't look on your sheet. It ain't on, that one ain't on there. That's a freebie. But think about, these, think about these three things. Number one, we need to learn to have persistence in prevailing over discouragement. Prevailing over discouragement. 1 Kings 19, 14 is the passage where Elijah said, what? They done killed these fellas over here. They've killed the prophets. They've done this. They've done that. And I'm all alone, Lord. I'm the last one. Elijah was discouraged. Now, the Lord didn't necessarily rebuke him for his discouragement. But he gave him a word of encouragement. He said, I still got 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 
That's a word of encouragement. Notice, God didn't rebuke him for being discouraged. He gave him what he needed to overcome his discouragement. He gave him the information that he needed. Look, it's not a sin to be discouraged. It's not a sin to be discouraged. Certainly the Lord was discouraged at many times in his ministry. One, and Mark, one passage in Mark says, he marveled at their unbelief. Don't you think that made him discouraged? What about John 7 when his own brethren didn't believe in him? Don't you think that discouraged the Lord? How about when his own disciples that walked with him day after day after day after day still didn't understand the nature of the kingdom and the purpose of his coming? Don't you think that'd be discouraging? The Lord was discouraged. It's not a sin to be discouraged. But we've got to be persistent in the face of discouragement. And then we have to prevail over discouragers. Number two, or letter B. Before, before I go into number two, I'm, I'm going to make, make me something. Just ask y'all something. Do you think Lynn and Walter have ever been discouraged? I could ask Sheila or Faye without having to ask them. Think little Walter had been discouraged? Do you think I've ever been discouraged? Let me ask you a question. Just because at some point I've been discouraged, does that mean I don't love this church? Does it mean I don't love all of you? Just because Lynn and Walter may have been discouraged, does that mean that, 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 that they don't love me and they don't love my family and they don't love you? Well, of course not. We know that's foolish thought. You know, sometimes, and I'd even venture to say, a lot of the time, my discouragement, and I'm not speaking for Lynn or Walter, okay? I'm speaking for me. All right, my discouragement is of my own making. It's of my own making. Let me give you an example. And I still have a hard time getting over this. All right, I still I still struggle with it all the time. If I want something to get done here at Burleson. My mindset is what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Why? Because I don't trust you to do it. <laughs> I don't think you can do it. I, what, I'm not saying those are the reasons. But for whatever reason is, in, in the, t the time that I've been here, there's a lot of things that, that, that I've taken on myself that I should have let somebody else do. I should have asked somebody to do it. I should have asked Lady Walter to find somebody to do it. But instead, I'm going to take it on myself to get it done because that way if I do it, I know that it'll get done the way I want it to get done and it'll get done. But guess what? My way of getting it done might not be the best way to get it done. Might not be the most efficient way to get it done. Might not be the most long-term best way to have it, have it done. But if you start taking things on yourself and you don't allow others to help you, then you get it in your mindset that other people don't care because they're not doing it. But why are they not doing it? Because I've decided to take it on myself to, for me to do it. And I struggle with that. I struggle with it. And I know it's not right for me to think that way. And so that's why, in, in, especially in the last you know, three or four years, I've tried to involve, look, I've had it in the bulletin two or three weeks. I can't thank Fowl enough for the work she's done on our bulletin shelves and the work she's done on the directory. Ten years ago, guess who would have done all that? <laughs> Probably Rosalind. But, but that would have been something I would have done. Something I would have done. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to get out of the mindset that i got to do everything. Because it's not good for me. It's not, it's not good for you. Have to learn to overcome discouragement, but when you have when you have discouragement, 
The problem I found out is that my discouragement oftentimes is my fault. It's my fault that I'm discouraged. Then secondly, prevailing over discouragers. Discouragers. In Nehemiah 4, 1 to 3, you have the Jews are trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And there's two guys by the name of Sanballat and Tobias. Or Tobias. And what they do is they go out and they mock the people for doing right. They mock Nehemiah. They mock the people that are working. And here's what they said. If a fox ran across that wall, he'd knock it down. Mocking them. Well, then that mockery wasn't enough. Then they, they, they took up arms. They decided they were going to actively persecute those brethren. Those Jewish brethren. To hinder them from doing the work that they'd set out to do. So we all, so there's a difference in overcoming discouragement, which oftentimes is self-inflicted, and overcoming discouragers, who are those who are outside seeking to discourage us themselves. And then lastly, I, and I just mentioned this word, is the ability to prevail over persecution. Prevail over persecution. I mean, I would, have, I would have never guessed our country would be in the shape that it's in right now. Not even 10 years ago. Much less 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, it's a sad, it's a sad situation. I mean, I just saw yesterday where Nancy Pelosi and them were going to try to get rid of the words mother, father, son, and daughter in, le in legislative words, in legislative terms. Because they're not inclusive. By the way, even the CDC has bought into this garbage. About uh, uh, They put out a statement talking about pregnant people. Now last time I checked, it should say pregnant women. But now they're going to talk about pregnant People, as if there's somebody other than a woman who can be pregnant. Now that's the world we live in. And I don't see it getting any better. So what does that mean? That means that a lot of the outlets that we have, for example, Facebook, YouTube, etc., are probably going to start putting the clamps on us doing the things that we do with regard to live stream and broadcasting and whatnot. And that the federal governmental entities are probably going to start putting the screws to us. The question is, is, is there enough in us to persevere and prevail over those things? By the way, and that's just the... Look, all these things are just the next step to, to overt persecution. Overt persecution. I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime. But I feared that I might. I feared that I might. I think the only way you probably don't see it, I said the, probably the only way that I don't see it in my lifetime, is if there's some type of, if there's some type of, I, I don't want to use the word civil war because I'd like to see some type of secession. A secession. But those things never end peacefully. That's a general rule. But even then, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. It's going to require sacrifice. It's going to be hard on the church. The question is, are we cut out of that bolt of cloth that's going to get us through? I heard a guy say, people willing to give their lives for their country, but not willing to give up their jobs. Now, having said all that, do we spend more time worrying, and by the way, preaching to, I'm preaching to self now, alright? Do we spend more time worrying about the future of what this country is going to be, or do we spend more time focused on what our true, where our true loyalties lie, which is in the kingdom of God. 
Because last time I checked, the kingdom of God did not need governmental uh, protection or blessing in order to exist or to thrive. So we are we cut out of that kind of you know we cut it out cut out of that bolt of cloth. And where do our loyalties lie? And where do our confidence or where does our confidence lie? Is our confidence in the ability of the government to protect us and give us our rights? Or is our confidence in the Lord? who never guaranteed us the freedom of speech, never guaranteed us the freedom of assembly, never gave us the freedom uh, 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 to, to, to evangelize without fear. The Lord never promised any of those things. The early church didn't have those things. And they seemed to do all right. They seemed to do all right. And so we have to have an unwavering and unwavering persistence. All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop right there. Lord will, we'll finish this up. We'll finish this up uh, next Sunday morning. Or I may, I may finish it tonight. I, I'll make up my mind. Make up my mind this afternoon. Being better finishers, better planning, better preparation, better patience, and unwavering persistence. Maybe the case that you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be a, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Willing to change the way that you think and change the way that you live. You're willing to confess your faith in Him, but you've never been immersed in water to receive the remission of your sins. Be a better finisher. There was an old trap years and years ago when I was a kid. It said, don't die on third. Don't die on third. In other words, don't get all the way, nearly all the way around the bases and die at third. Be a better finisher. Make it all the way home. Finish, you know, finish what you've started. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're here as a child of God, you've sinned in some way, and you, you've neglected, uh, you, you've neglected your walk with God, and you, you've sinned in some way that, that that needs public confession. Whatever we can do to help you, if, if you stand in need uh, to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, we encourage you to come right now. Together, we stand and sing this song. I have decided.